वेलकम टू ई पी जी पाठशाला आई एम जीतु मिश्रा फ्रॉम विरासत हिंद फाउंडेशन अहमदाबाद फॉर द नेक्स्ट थर्टी मिनट्स आई एम गोइंग टू डिस्कस विथ यू अबाउट द आर्ट एंड आर्किटेक्चर ऑफ निजाम साहिद सल्तानत इन टेकन विच रूल्ड फ्रॉम द सिटी ऑफ मॉडर्न डे अहमदनगर इन द रीजन ऑफ डेकन इन महाराष्ट्र बिफोर वी स्टार्ट द डायनेस्टी निजाम साहिद डायनेस्टी इट इज़ इम्पॉर्टेंट टू नो दैट वेन इन थर्टीन सेंचुरी मोहम्मद बिन तुगलक सिफ्टेड इज कैपिटल टू दौलताबाद इट वॉज ए मेजर सेंटर ऑफ हिंदू किंगडम्स लाइक फॉर एग्जाम्पल यादवर्स वेर द मेजर रूलिंग डायनेस्टी इन द रीजन ऑफ दौलताबाद विच वॉज एक्चुअली कॉल्ड देवगिरी लेटर इट बिकेम दौलताबाद ड्यूरिंग द टाइम ऑफ मोहम्मद बिन तुगलक ही नेम डिट टू दौलता दौलताबाद एंड द सिटी ऑफ वेल्थ so uh, once it became a major center of uh, once uh, dolatabad was uh, turned into as a islamic capital soon deccan became uh, a major center of islamic culture and scholarship uh, a lot of sufi uh, saints uh, merchants uh, calligraphers they came from north india as well as from central asia and persia so they brought in uh, you know a, a range of ideas uh, which for the first time intermingled with the local deccanic culture and the composite culture which we today identify as deccanic culture evolved in the process in the in the due time so uh, bahmani uh, after uh, the after uh, it became the capital of uh, mohammed bin tughlaq but it didn't continue for a long time because he had to shift to delhi again and uh, by keeping you know appointing a governor but at the same time uh, uh, bahmanis who actually made a revolt against uh, uh, the uh, tughlaq in uh, dolatabad they established a new kingdom initially at dolatabad and then later uh, they shifted the capital to gulbarga and finally to bidar so when with the establishment of bahmani uh, the first building uh, which is called chand minar uh, is a tall uh, minaret uh and it is second after the famous qutub minar in delhi uh, which was erected by the bahmanis uh, as a as a sign of victory uh and then um, you know it became a major center but towards the end of 15th century uh and early 16th century uh it was fragmented into bahmani uh, empire frag was fragmented into uh, five major kingdoms uh five kingdoms but uh, three being the major kingdoms such as uh, adil sahis of bijapur uh, qutub sahis of golconda and nizam sahis of uh, ahmednagar so the nizam sahis among these three uh, was uh, another important dynasty um, which uh, ruled uh, between 15th and 17th centuries so the capital was initially at junnar uh, in deccan Uh, but it was shifted uh, to or uh, dolata uh, sorry or ahmednagar immediately uh, after uh, ahmed shah uh, ahmed nizam shah uh, uh, established himself as the founder of the dynasty and during uh, their rule there were other forts as well like purandare uh, and dolatabad itself so they also became uh, uh, you know major centers of architectural activities and um, so uh, uh, you may not see a large number of monuments um, as you see in case of uh, golconda or in bijapur uh, in ahmednagar but uh, but uh, what we see that this region witnessed a uh, series of architectural innovation starting from the time of bahmanis uh, even before that it was hindu kingdoms like adabas then bahmani and then nizam sahis and after that the moguls so you have like you know a large number of monuments representing different ideas different faiths different developments uh, within this small region of ahmednagar dolatabad and uh, aurangabad so uh, this was a major center of architectural innovations in the past so we will be learning a lot about these in the succeeding uh, in in the succeeding time so when we talk about the birth of Ahmad the Nizam Said dynasty uh, it was we must refer to the opening of uh, the 16th century CE uh, which which witnessed the fragmentation of the Bahmani kingdom into five smaller sultanates uh, 
uh, and each governed by an independent uh, kingdom. Uh, out of these five, the three were most important as, as we discussed just now. Uh, they were uh, the Nizam size of Ahmednagar, the Qutub size of Kolkonda and the Adil size of Bijapur. So when we talk about how Najim, uh, how uh, Nizam size came into uh, power, so the the origin is like you know it it starts at the time of uh, uh, Mahmud Gawan who was the uh, main person behind he was the commander and the main person behind the success of Bahmani Empire into a full fledged large empire in the country. So the origin of Nizam Sai rule can be traced to the time of Malik Hasan Bahari who was actually Hindu uh, converted into Islam uh, he, and he was also holding a very senior position at the Bahmani court in Bidar. He had recognition uh, because he was a warrior on behalf of Muhammad Gawan. He fought a number of war, but he he had a dream to become establish his own kingdom, but it was never fulfilled uh, because uh, he uh, uh, Muhammad Gawan lost his life. He died and he was also murdered himself in 15, uh, 1486. So. Uh, his uh, dream of becoming uh, establishing a uh, sultanate of his own was never fulfilled. But when it comes to his second, his son, uh, Hassan's son, uh, his name was Malik Ahmed, he fulfilled his father's dream. Uh, in, he founded the new capital uh, uh, on the bank of River Sina, uh, uh, that is uh, in Aurang, uh, is at present day Ahmednagar. Uh, and, uh, he also not only uh, established a new city, uh, but also he strengthened the existing fort at Dolatabad. So he was actually the founder of Nizam Sai dynasty. And uh, then a number of other sultans who followed uh, Malik Ahmed, uh, they actually made a lot of contributions uh, in the field of art and architecture and also in miniature paintings. After Ahmed Shah, Ahmed Shah uh, uh, the second king was Burhan I, uh, who was the next ruler and he ruled for a very long period. And uh, during his rule, uh, Shia Islam was adopted as the state religion. And uh, because Shia was adopted and it was a major religion in Persia, that is Iran. So the court of Ahmednagar and the courts of Persia, uh, they were brought together. Uh, through close contacts. So there was always exchange of ideas whether it was in the field of art or in architecture or in literature or uh, in any subject, any creative subject. So there was a lot of cultural uh, exchange program between these two uh, regions. So and because of that uh, what happened um, we see a large number of uh, a lot of influence of Persia over uh, in the monuments of Ahmednagar. So Burhan was also, uh, the, though he ruled uh, for 43 years, it was not peaceful as it would have, it should have been. He had to constantly engage himself um, fighting, you know, in wars against uh, um, uh, the Bijapur dynasty, uh, uh, that is the Adil Sai dynasty, and for which he had to always seek help from both Vijayanagar rulers as well as Golconda rulers. So there was uh, always ties with uh, Amasa, with uh, between Buranban and the, the rulers of uh, Vijayanagar and Golconda to fight against the Bijapur kings. So it was his rule was not peaceful. Buran's son Hussein was the most illustrious sultan of the entire dynasty and uh, uh, because of his ties with the Portuguese there was peace prevailed uh, in his kingdom um, and uh, he was also credited for building the circular fort in Ahmednagar uh, which is called Ahmednagar fort today. Uh, it is also one of the unique forts uh, where you have which we will be learning in detail about it in, in, uh, in after some time. And another important event which uh, had happened uh, during the time of during the rule of Hussein was uh, in 1564 CE, uh, Hussein had led uh, the combined forces of Bijapur, Golconda and Bidar to counter the threat from Bijanagar. So Ramaraya died uh, in the battle of Bijakot, uh, in the battle of Talikota, which was fought against uh, the Bijanagar and that brought down the 
end of the Vijayanagar, the most powerful Hindu dynasty uh, in India. Uh, but uh, the defeat of Ramav Raya was decisive, but uh, there was not much gain for Hussein uh, personally because he died shortly after the battle. Hussein was succeeded by his son uh, Murtaja I. Uh, now, whatever you know, the alliance uh, which was which had been established between uh, Ahmednagar uh, dynasty and uh, Golconda and Barisai dynasty and uh, Bijapur dynasty, that is Adil Sai dynasty, it was now broken. It was no more uh, there. So in 1574, uh, because there was always uh, conflict between these dynasty, so there has to be new political ties, uh, you know, uh, for uh, Murtaja want to establish to strengthen his power and authority. So in 1574, Berar, which was one of the uh, five uh, kingdoms uh, which had been carved out uh, after the Bahmanis uh, empire decline, was brought under the control of Ahmednagar dynasty. And, uh, and during Murtaja's rule, uh, art and architecture reached to a hallmark. Uh, that can be, you know, exemplified uh, when we look at uh, the beautiful Farah Bagh, uh, a pleasure garden uh, in his capital at Ahmednagar. So, uh, uh, with the invasion of the Adil Sahis uh, in 1595 CE, uh, the subsequent de demise of Ibrahim's state affairs were taken over by Ibrahim's sister Chand Bibi. So, Chand Bibi was now the most uh, illustrious uh, woman ruler in the history of Deccan uh, and she was a warrior uh, and she proved to be an able ruler also but uh, could not prevent Berar from Mughals in 1596 CE. Then Ahmednagar was subjugated to Mughal Empire in 1600 by Akbar's commander Abul Fajal, who had also murdered Chand Bibi. Now, in the history of uh, Deccani uh, Nizam Sahi architecture, Nizam Sahi period, uh, Sultanate, uh, there was a rise of uh, uh, a Hawasi slave called Malik Ambar, and who became extremely powerful. Uh, he emerged as the most powerful figure in the Nizam Sahi court at the turn of 17th century CE. Uh, so, because of his uh, war tactics, guerrilla warfare and all, he was able to uh, throw out uh, the Mughals from Ahmednagar and crown Murtaza II as the next Sultan. He had led expeditions against, against Bijapur and Golconda and even managed to withstand the attacks of Khane Khan, the commander of Mughal forces under Jahangir. After installing Burhan III uh, on the throne, Malik Ambar resumed his offence against Bijapur and Golconda, but had only limited success with the Mughals. After the death of uh, Malik Ambar, uh, in the subsequent years, the Mughals uh, had again uh, started invading uh, the Ahmednagar court and Dolatabad fort. And, uh, you know, at that time, they could not resist, the Nizam Rai Sai rulers could not resist the Mughal attack. So, in 1636, Murtaza III, the last, he was the last Nizam Sai ruler. He was um, uh, taken as a prisoner, and uh, shortly after this, uh, you know, the Nizam Sai rule ended, uh, and then uh, uh, the entire uh, activity was the whole of Nizam Sai was taken over by the Mughals. So it became part of the Mughal Empire. Now, with this introductions to the historical aspect of uh, Nizam Sai's, we should uh, we will now look at the architecture of forts and palaces which were built during the time of Nizam Sahis. So when we talk about the fort and palaces of Nizam Sahis, the first thing that comes to our attention is the Ahmednagar fort. Uh, earlier at the time of Ahmasa, it was a mud fort, but later at the time of Hussein, it was built as a large circular fort. Uh, the Ahmednagar fort is uh, actually circular in plan with about 100 meet, 80 meter in diameter and 20 meter high. It has two regularly placed round bastions. At 10, it has it is surrounded by a moat of 10 meter width uh, that encircles the moat all around. Inside the fort, uh, if you compare it with uh, Bijapur, Golconda, or uh, or uh, the Mahabani Bahamani capital at uh, Gulbarga and as well as in B uh, Bidar, uh, th there are large number of monuments, you know, palatial structures and monuments. But here. Uh, the, you will find only one uh, monument that is the tomb of Amatsa, the founder of the Nizam Sai dynasty. Uh, that is the only surviving structure and it has a, uh, it has a reception hall and roof with a sequence of domes. 
besides Ahmednagar fort there was Purandar fort uh, which is uh, which was yet another major fort where they uh, the Nizam Sahis had a uh, considerable uh, contributions they had control over it uh, it has it located near Mahar, uh, near Pune in Maharashtra uh, the fort of Purandar has two distinct levels uh, its lower part is called Machi and the upper part is called Balikila so a major architectural remains in the upper part is Delhi Darwaja. The fort was also elaborated in la, elaborated and new additions were made during the time of Maratha rule and even during the time of British rule. There was another fort which was also the uh, one of the capitals of Berar. Uh, it's called Gwali Ghor Fort, which is located in the Satpura range uh, and uh, now under the Melghat Tiger Century in northern part of Maharashtra, uh, which is also identified as the region of Khandes. So, uh, so it's very close to uh, the Chikal, Chikladhara uh, hill, hill, town, uh, hill station, uh, only 2.5 kilometers from this. So, uh, this Gavli uh, Gard uh, fort took its name uh, of a person, uh, he was actually a shepherd, uh, his name was Gavli, uh, centuries ago, that is what the local myth says. Uh, but it was uh, initiated. Uh, uh, a large, it was actually fortified uh, during the rule of the Berar dynasty and later uh, by the Ahmadnagar dynasty. So it was repaired and uh, extended by Fatehullah Imadul Mulk, the founder of Imasai in Berar. And it was also occupied by Imasai in 1488C and Nizamsai in 1574C. So the fort has got uh, main gateways, uh, the Dalib Darwaza, uh, two main gateways. One is called the Delhi Darwaza uh, between the inner and the outer fort and the Fateh Darwaza, the southwestern gate uh, built by Fatehullah Imadur Mulk. So there are two major gates. Now when we talk about the fort uh, architectures, uh, the most important one after uh, Ahmadnagar is Dolatabad. And uh, Dolatabad, uh, uh, in Dolatabad um, is actually the fort which divides north and south. It was a major important fort going back to the time of Yadavas when it was called Devagiri uh, because of uh, uh, because it was believed that uh, uh, Lord Shiva resided there. So it was called it is uh, it's, it was called Devagiri. It had tremendous wealth and because of its wealth, it had attracted uh, the rulers from north, the Sultanate rulers from north, including uh, Ma, Ma, Ma Khilji Alauddin Khilji and then later. Uh, Mohammed bin Tughlaq. So uh, there was se several contributions made by uh, Malik Ambar uh, in uh, when uh, you know when he was in power uh, during the Nizam, later Nizam Sai rules. Uh, there is a the, the one part of the fort which is called Ambar Court, uh, which is actually the exterior end wall of the surrounding Dolatabad fort. Uh, it is called Ambar Fort. It is believed that Malik Ambar constructed it to protect from the onslaught of Mughals. The fortification wall, uh, which is uh, which encloses an irregular uh, oval area, is about 14 kilometers, and the outermost wall uh, of the fort consists of uh, 45 bastions and nine principal gates, um, with flanking bastions and towers. Now, uh, this this was what uh, these were the forts uh, of Nizam Sahis, though they had uh, uh, constructed their own fort at Ahmadnagar, but they also contributed significantly in other forts which we saw in Puranda and uh, Kavalika, and then uh, also in the uh, fort of Dolatabad. Now, Farah Bagh in Ahmadnagar uh, is uh, uh, is the, the it was the pleasure garden. Uh, which was built in the model uh, of a Persian uh, palace, uh, but it was it, but its grandeur and size has was much more to do with the Persian uh, monuments. So it is uh, uh, it is located uh, in the middle of a large pool. Uh, it is of two storey, uh, uh, which can be and it can be approached uh, from the north by. A causeway which is of 72 meters long uh, and it is octagonal in plan uh, and uh, almost 40 meter in cross uh, there are uh, there are facades on four sides uh, uh, which display double height arch portals planked by tires and small arch recesses repeated on the angled corner faces there was another uh, uh, bag or the garden which is called Hayat Behist Bag. Uh, 
uh, where you have a two storied octagonal pavilion standing in a similar shape pond it was a pleasure resort for the nizam sahib you have also uh, a hammam attached to the uh, building uh, where both hot and cold water uh, uh, was uh, you know uh, could be uh, used uh, using cisterns um, and uh, it was a pleasure bath so then you have underground water palace uh, besides that uh with uh, has a wind tower and that is the only example from deccan uh this is again influenced by the iranian architecture like a chimney like tower uh with angled vents at the top uh, the vents allowed breeze uh, to flow and cool down the palace um which was uh, uh, which was subterranean which had subterranean dome chamber arranged around a rectangular pond aurangabad uh, the city which was established by uh, malik ambar Uh, in 1610 ce uh, it was earlier known as kirki later it became uh, it came to be known as uh, aurangabad after the mogal emperor or aurangzeb so uh, you have one of the best uh, examples of water management in the whole of india when it comes to the uh, when it comes to aurangabad uh, or earlier it was known as kirki so water was transported to the city from different springs and wells because the landscape of uh, aurangabad is such that it is located in the sayadri mountain range um, so there are number of hills uh, where you have perennial streams so this spring and uh, you know were, were used the, the water from the springs were trapped and transported uh, through a range of aqueducts and wells uh, by a, a, a extensive network of aqueducts channels and pipes and then you have this channel sometimes are even more than 5 km long and uh, they are partly cut into the rock and roofed with masonry so this was an idea which was in, which had been imported from iran to deccan there is uh, panch panchaki uh, which is actually a water mill that stands besides the river kem um, has a tower of this type uh, so water falling from the elevated system drives the large wheel for grinding grain so when it comes to water management uh, Deccan had played a very important role. Uh, we had seen at uh, Bidar, Bijapur, and Golconda that how water was managed because the whole of Deccan is a semi-arid regions with uh, scarcity of water. And uh, the advantage of Deccan is that th- there are large number of streams, perennial streams, which are uh, found in the surrounding uh, mountains or hills, and from where water had to be brought to the capitals. so the iranian principle of uh, using water which is also called kare system so was employed successfully in these uh, cities of deccan sultanates and aurangabad was also uh, not an exception because aurangabad's location is uh, again in a uh, region where you have hill surrounding the capital uh, so the water had to be uh, imported from these hills uh, and uh, the best way was to you know to lay uh, for to lay a extensive uh, uh, aqueduct systems and pipes uh, which and also sometimes underground that is called kare systems so we have uh, uh, a large number of uh, such things in uh, aurangabad along with other cities so that is how it has got some of the best examples of water management so today when the country is reeling through you know severe drought the region of especially the region of uh, marathawada and uh, maharashtra in the the sayadri region is reeling through severe drought there is a scarcity of water so it is important to see that how successfully they were managing water resources so maybe that uh, can be used in today's context uh, uh, to meet the need of the water uh, for the local communities now uh, with this uh, we i have finished now uh, the the fort and uh, palaces and also along with that how water was successfully uh, managed uh, in, uh, in the nizam sai period uh, both in his capital at uh, ahmednagar as well as also in aurangabad now it is uh, the time to see uh, their achievement in building tombs so one uh, unlike bidar or bijapur or golconda where you have tombs large royal tombs 
you would not see much tombs in uh, uh, of uh, nizam sai rulers because they were shia muslims and it was part of their belief that you know they had to be bur uh, buried um, at karbala uh, uh, in the place where hussein had fought the war against uh, uh, his enemies um, and th that is how he was martyred so uh, in the most of their bones after the death the, the death of the sultans were transported to karbala for uh, where they were buried but there is an exception the founder of the dynasty ahmad bari nizam sahi uh, he had built uh, his tomb uh, in 1509 ce uh, uh, which is located uh, inside uh, ahmad nagar uh, inside uh, and that is the centerpiece of bag roja so this tomb has arched opening flanked by similarly shaped recesses on each side and the facade is ornamented with carved panels of different designs and its interior is also lavishly decorated with a line of plaster arches when we talk about mosques uh, there are number of mosques uh, but the best preserved uh, in uh, uh, ahmednagar is damri mosque which was built in 1568 ce uh, it is look it is located at a distance of 500 meter northeast of the great circular fort in ahmednagar though it is very small in size compared to what other uh, mosques we have in india but it it's it is uh, a finely finished one epitomizing the carved intricacy of the nizam sai style chini mahal in inside dolatabad fort is another important uh, building uh, which was uh, uh, which was built uh, uh, during the rule of the nizam sai so dolatabad had served as the govern government seat of nizam sai after ahmednagar was temporarily lost to the moguls in 1601 ce so there are several structures built inside but the most important was the chini mahal it is called because of its uh, beautiful blue tiles uh, blue and white tiles uh, which are set into the facade of the buildings and uh, so that is the only place where you have uh, among the uh, monuments of uh, among the survived monuments of nizam sai's uh, having blue tiles now uh, when we uh, talk about the tombs uh, the most impressive tomb is uh, actually of malik ambar which is located in khultabad uh, to the north of uh, dolatabad uh, the, the the malik the malik ambar tomb is the most impressive tomb which is located in khultabad uh, it was built in 1626 ce so uh, this building which stands uh, alone uh, has got three crispy worked recesses with lobed arches are set into each side of the building uh, in the middle uh, uh, recess you have beautiful jali screens uh, displaying uh, varied uh, and finely cut geometric patterns screens also flank the doorway on the southern side um, and immediately uh, outside the walls of the complex stand the tomb of malik ambar's wife also with stone screens and there is also a mosque attached to it a few meters uh, southwest of these monuments is a small and uh, highly uh, small but highly individual tomb now ruined uh, which is of actually of malik ambar's grandson it consists again of an octagonal dome chamber on a square plinth with octagonal pillars standing freely at the corners you also see remnants of jali work in this monument now uh, nizam size uh, as we discussed uh, before uh you know in the uh, early 17th century they fell to uh, the moguls and uh, the whole of ahmednagar uh, and uh, dolatabad and aurangabad was uh, became part of the mogal uh, rule it was part of mogal empire so that was in 1636 when murtaza 3 the last nizam sai ruler was taken as a prisoner and uh, after uh, this uh the sultan nizam sai uh, sultanate was absorbed into the mogal empire after dolatabad became a strong hold uh, bastion of mogal empire both the fort and nearby aurangabad became well established center of mogal architectures and the most impressive is the uh, bibi ka maqbara which is located in uh, aurangabad so it was commissioned by aurangzeb's son azam in the memory of his mother dilras banu begum because of its strong resembles with uh, the taj mahal in agra it is also called as dakhani taj the taj of deccan uh, the mausoleum is laid out in a charbagh formal garden as you see also in other uh, mogal monuments uh, 
uh, Mughal tombs. It stands at the center of a huge enclosure. You have pillared pavilions are located at the center of north, east and western part of the enclosure wall. The mausoleum is built on a high square platform with four minarets at its corners. It's approached by a flight of steps from three sides. It is made out of marble like the one you have in uh, Taj. Now with this, uh, we are uh, concluding the uh, contributions made by art and architecture uh, by the Nizam Sahis. So they had made contributions to both art and architecture of Deccan and had promises of the flowering of an entirely new culture. And some of their paintings, uh, the murals are, are world class, which have no parallel with the uh, Mughal. They, uh, they, they appear to be, you know, a, a fantasy uh, type uh, as compared to the Mughal paintings where, you, where the logic was more preferred, given more importance. So, on, uh, but after their fall, the region did not uh, uh, discontinue. So it continued to flourish under the patronage of the Mughals. As we saw in uh, Aurangabad, it was, there are a number of uh, Mughal buildings. The most famous, as we discussed just now, is the Taj uh, of uh, Deccan, that is the Bibika Makbara. So there was a continuity of architecture traditions. And uh, together in this small region, uh, you have art and architecture starting uh, uh, from the time of uh, Yadavas till the Mughals, uh, um, which uh, including the Nizam Sahis, uh, you have some of the finest specimens of art and architectures in these regions. So for more information on this, uh, you may have to refer to uh, the exhaustive note which has been developed for you. And along with that, there are also references given. So that will uh, help you to understand the uh, uh, the contribution made by Nizam Say Art and Architectures much more elaborately. Thank you for being patient.